The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. We'll get started. Welcome. Is everyone enjoying Southeast Linux Fest? Who's a newbie? Who's like here for the first time? Okay, well I'm a first timer too, so don't feel bad. Okay. Um, after you start going to conferences for a while and you go to them six, seven, eight years in a row, um, you get to know people, but it's always good to go to a new one. So I'm here today. And I know the title of the talk actually was called Disaster is Inevitable and disaster is inevitable. Uh, however, since presenting the talk, I actually changed the title a little bit uh, to make it a little bit more marketing friendly. However, it's the same talk, don't be alarmed. Today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about some quite notable MySQL disasters. Um, I, there are quite a few that one could talk about, and I could spend an entire session just talking about interesting things, but the premise of this talk is to scare you to realize that these disasters are real, any type of disaster is real, and you should work towards avoiding your own. In this presentation, I'm going to provide a little bit of philosophy things that will stick in your mind, or keep you awake at night, words you may be able to use to scare your management team with, uh, or ways to try and get more funding. So this is one of many. And quite simply, it is, no one cares if you can back up, only that you can restore. So even though we're gonna be talking about backup procedures, and people will create backup procedures and test backup procedures, and then put them on remote control, it really doesn't help when you find out that you can't actually use your backup. <clears throat> so there are some initial steps that I want to talk about and I'll highlight five steps that I use, the five steps to uh, recovery. We can come up with a better term for that, you know, five steps for, you know, a database is anonymous or something. Um, I have a couple of examples I want to share with you just to show you what happens in a well-prepared and less prepared environment. And I really want to point out two important aspects in the recovery process that are specific to MySQL. One is understanding, interpreting, and using the concept of point in time, and how MySQL replication works in the use of backup and recovery. Because a high available system doesn't start with one server. High availability starts with two, or one zero, or something like that. So replication is an important factor in having a highly available environment with backup and recovery. Um, I think some of you, oh, some of you weren't here from the first presentation, so here's the blurb about me. I've been doing this MySQL stuff for a little while now. I've written a couple of books. Someone said I was the all-time top blogger. Um, I work for MySQL. I do a lot of speaking. In fact, uh, last year I managed 13 different countries in terms of being invited to go speak at MySQL-related uh, talks. And I do MySQL consulting on my own as an individual. So if you have a problem later, come and talk to me and we can talk terms. So here are five steps that I want to talk about in terms of backup and recovery. And I want to describe these first before I start talking about certain circumstances so that I can reinforce the things that you should be doing with MySQL. And if you're not doing these with MySQL, you should be upfront in saying that you're not so that you can uh, work through them uh, and get on to knowing that your system is safe. The first is you have to have a backup strategy. Now, I guess really point zero is you have to have thought about creating a backup strategy and a recovery strategy and at least tried something. Um, that's important to start with. When it comes to backups, there are two essential components to a MySQL backup. The first is a static and consistent backup of your data. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about static and consistent later because both of those words are important. You can have a static backup that's not consistent. And the second most important thing is the master binary logs. These are the archive redo logs, the transactions that have occurred since your static consistent backup. Correspondingly, if you have a recovery process, follows a similar pattern. You perform a recovery of the static portion and then you do a point in time recovery which is taking the data from the time in which the last backup occurred, for example 2 o'clock this morning, up until now, 2.45 p.m., all those orders, all those transactions, all those customer comments, tweets, everything that you have that you really want to keep. That is what's nece necessary to do a point in time recovery. The third step, which may sound like it doesn't need to be a point, but really is, is, is that you have to verify every step that you take in your process. Every command that you execute, you have to look at the status. You have to look at the errors. And you also have to look at creating expectations of the results that you're actually getting both approximate and precise. What do you approximately expect in a particular step? How long do you expect it to take, for example? This is important because if you skip one of these steps, then a great backup and recovery process could become useless because you didn't verify one step. So it's very important. That's why it's reiterated here. Now, in my time of dealing with customers, and I've been doing consulting um, both in Oracle in the 90s and MySQL in the 2000s, so I've been doing this for a while, very few people understand what testing actually is. People go, you know, how do you test the software? Well, you know, we, we make sure that it starts and stops and does this and does that. And that's fine if you want to do a smoke test. But testing is about trying to break your software or break your process. So with every backup and recovery process you're doing, you have to look at these edge cases because they're the things that will cause pain when you least expect it. So it's an important thing to realize that testing your process and testing all of those exception cases is what you work on. And finally, it's important that you have applicable redundancy in place. People use RAID 5 and RAID 10 and dual network cards because they want to create redundancy. And redundancy is not a replacement for backup and recovery. It's just an ability to reduce the different types of scenarios that you have to cater for. MySQL is no different, <clears throat> particularly having copies of the data not on the server in question. If you have a server and you do a backup on a server, you leave the files on that server or leave the copies of the binary log on that server, doesn't work if you can't access the server. Whether someone's powered it off, the hard drive failed, the building burnt down, you need to have copies of your data elsewhere. So we've gone through those five steps and as you were drawn to this presentation today, disaster is inevitable. It will happen. There is an absolute guarantee that it will happen. However, total failure of your system is avoidable with appropriate planning. You can avoid common scenarios if you actually know about them. You can avoid less common scenarios. Now, there is no way to avoid everything. Sooner or later, you know, the world will run out of power, every computer will stop, and then it doesn't matter what backup strategy you have. Or an earthquake or a power problem will take out a whole west coast uh, and you have to have like geo redundancy. So every time you have a particular strategy in place, you know, you can go one step further. You can go from one server to two servers. You can go to n servers, but the n servers in one rack and then there's a power problem on the rack and you go to two racks or two data centers and so forth. So there are ever increasing ways to improve your system uh, at greater cost. So you have to determine what's also acceptable for your business. I have two stories I want to share with you because now I've given you the steps that you need to undertake. I haven't talked about how to do them, but I've given you the steps to think about what's involved. And I want to go through two examples. 
The first example is a customer who has MySQL replication in place, a master and two slaves, so they've already thought about high availability. They've got a dedicated machine that they can take offline and do a copy on the slave, so they don't have to worry about any blocking operations, so they can have 24 by 7 operations. They make copies of the binary logs and they put them on another machine every five minutes, so they've got copies of the data in case that primary machine goes away and they don't want to use a slave machine to fail over to. They've actually tested the process. They've actually gone through and like recreated a new server and brought back the backup file and restored the backup file, and done a point in time recovery. And they actually also have monitoring in place so that if the system goes down or replication uh, fails or something, then an alert will be presented. If you don't have those things in place, then you should. This organization has all these things in place. So you would assume that their backup and recovery strategy will work. Yes? No? Maybe? Put it this way, if you don't have all those things in place, you're at a higher risk than this customer. Who has all of those things in place with their MySQL? Any brave soul? One brave soul. Excellent. I don't think I have it in these slides, but I have on my website the, the first 10 things that you should do it, uh, to review your backup and recovery. It's like a quiz, the first 10 points. It's not all of the points, it's just the first 10. And I've yet to find a customer, including myself, who does all 10. You know, my blog, I can afford not to check the backup log every day. You know, when a production customer, you can't do that. So here's a customer, here's an example. They've thought about their backup and recovery process. They have a full-time DBA on staff. They have a system administration team. But here's what happens at some time in the morning, never when you expect it to happen, the system was trying to write the binary log, which is the log that keeps a record of all the transactions on the master, and the disk filled up. And so MySQL turns off the logging for the entire duration of the process. Now, if anyone understands how replication works, master writes its changes to the data, writes its changes to the binary log, and the binary log is what's transferred to the slaves to replay that operation on the two slaves. But if it's not writing binary log transactions, but it's writing data, because the data is on a different partition, the slaves aren't getting the changes. So the master is now different to the two slaves. Not where you want to be. Now, as I mentioned, they have masters and slaves in, 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 in place for a reason. I already started talking, so it'll be a shortish, shorter story. So they have masters and slaves. They have system monitoring in place. Don't they have a monitoring alert for disk full, close to disk full? Of course they do. And did that alert fire? Of course it did. But the problem is the system administrator is on vacation. And the person that he trained to do that was actually looking at the errors but didn't really know what to do. And in this particular organization, there was a very fine line between system administration and database administration. And one of the procedural problems was is that the DBAs were not given the alerts to the system because that's the role of the system administration team. We know how to do that, so you don't need to know and have access to those things. So the system administration team have their fancy procedures, there are things to say the disk is filling up, but no one acted on something for four hours. So the disk filled up. What really does this mean? Well, first of all, you have a production system that is still writing data, so the data is there, but the two slaves are now completely useless. You can't use them because they don't have an ability to catch up to the master. There's a backup process in place. It backs up the slaves. Well, it can't back up a slave anymore because the slave is no longer consistent. So we now have a working environment that is almost completely broken. The system can continue to work, but the slaves that are being used for reading and reporting can no longer work. The backup strategy will no longer work. They're no longer in the ability to be able to recover their system. So the issue here is, is that they have to fix this problem. To fix this problem, they have to stop the master database. 
which you don't normally do because we have redundancy in place. They also have to take a backup of the master database because they have to recreate the two slaves. Now they haven't tested this because the backup process runs on the slave. The software doesn't even exist on the master. The slave with the backups actually has more disk space than the master and they can't actually even run a backup on the master. So there's this whole cascading effect of problems all because of one alert that wasn't looked at. So disasters can happen when you least expect it and it doesn't have to be something serious and you may already have all these procedures in place and you can still fail. So the triage of this problem was bureaucracy was a problem, information wasn't being shared that it should be, and this is actually ironically a common problem in larger organisations. Even though an appropriate person was trained, that person wasn't really knowledgeable and didn't really know what to do, and didn't disseminate the information. And information really has to be accessible to all parties. You know, if there are problems in the system, the more eyes that can see a dashboard of information, the more eyes that can alert to someone that there's a problem. And organisations that do these particular segmentations of we have to have a group that does this, we have to have a group that does that, and they're not allowed to touch the system, and they're not allowed to log in, and they're not allowed to look at it, this is counterproductive for a disaster. So there's an example of a procedure that was in place, tested, a highly paid DBA, dead in the water. He couldn't do anything because he'd been let down by someone else, but he's in charge of the database, so he's the one at fault. Here's another example that happened just a few weeks ago where um, a customer emails me, and in the morning I'm reading my email over breakfast, and I see subject emergency. Are you around? My production system has crashed and I'm traveling. Now, <clears throat> here's a customer who runs a single machine. He does have binary logging enabled because I reviewed his system some time ago and explained the importance of why you have binary logging. The person who does millions of dollars of orders in a day on his system. But he had a problem and he'd actually turned binary logging off because he was trying to address this problem. But he's running with a single server. He does backups, does a static copy of the backup. He makes a copy of the backup on another system. So he's, he's going down the right path in terms of having some procedures in place. What happened was he started getting these types of errors, which talk about a table being crashed or multiple tables being crashed. Has anyone seen that problem before? Yes, I see a few acknowledgements. Here's a problem when my ISAM, one of the internal storage engines, one of the ways in which you store data in MySQL, what's happened is, MySQL has actually crashed. The MySQL daemon process has crashed. Now there is what's known as an angel process called MySQL DSafe, which will detect that MySQL has crashed for some reason <coughs> and will restart MySQL. Now in a system that's not a high volume, this can actually happen and no one never actually ever knows. If you don't look at the error log, you don't actually know it's happened. Because it may happen, you know, the next PHP connection comes in, it's a new connection, it collects the database, it does its work. A result of that, if you use my ISAM, is you can get a situation like this where a table is marked as crashed. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the message is actually a little bit misleading. The, the data itself is actually intact. My ISAM consists of a file called myd, which is a data file, and myi, which is an index file. When you make a change, the data, the data is written to disk and flushed to disk. When you make a change to the index, it's written to disk but not flushed. It's held in memory and on disk. So if MySQL shuts down abnormally, what happens is the indexes are inconsistent with the data. The MyISAM, the, the, the B tree indexes or the full text indexes. And so crashed actually means I have a data inconsistency between indexes and um, data. Not a problem. It does happen. And there's a tool that allows you to check your my ISAM index files and see if a table has crashed or not. You can run a check and in this case, hey, there was a check, table's fine. Not a problem, okay? You have to do this when the system's down though. So if the system did crash and come back up again, you have to actually stop the system, stop access to the database, tell your users that it's unavailable to run the check. 
But if you run a check and there's some level of corruption in the table, then MySQL is going to throw an error message and mention to you that the index file that I just talked about is corrupt and that you have to repair that. Again, nothing critical because there's an ability to repair tables. Oh, that was a bit of a mistake. I don't exactly know how that happened, but we'll... Um, I have to confess, I do run Linux. This is the Linux test. This laptop does run Linux natively, and I do use this as my travel machine. Um, but I do still write my slides in Keynote on my Mac. Whoa, hold on. We've done that again. Sorry, my mistake. Maybe there's something wrong with the button. Let me do things this way. So as I said, we can do a, we, we have something's crashed. We can do a recover. And what recovery will do will rebuild the index for us. A problem here is if your tables are really large, this can take a long amount of time. But as you can see, not a problem. Index recovered. Good stuff. <coughs> what happens when the tool that's used and provided by MySQL to perform a recovery comes back and says, I'm sorry, I can't recover this? Then you start to get a little bit worried. There are some more significant options that you can look at. And if you look at the manual page, it'll say, well, be careful if you run this because you may lose data. So we're in a point now where we have to you know, understand what's going on. But what happens if you run that recovery tool that they tell you about to recover the data and it gives you a core dump? Then what are you going to do? Any suggestions? Pray. pray. <laughs> you should have prayed beforehand. <laughs> Back up and restore. Good choice. So we're going through this initial recovery process now, when I talked earlier about backup and recovery and the steps, what I didn't say is, is that there's another intermediate step where you do some diagnostics to see if you can repair or restart before you do a full recovery. So in this situation, we've gone through this triage where we're trying to work out, can we get the system back online without having to do a full restore of the system? Because that's a, the preferred option. It's generally going to be more quicker. And with this customer, I was, you know, we'd be going through, I was getting these error messages, and I'd be saying, well, you know, we can continue down this path to a point, but then we're going to have to start considering doing a full restore. And so we were still discussing this. And it wasn't until we get to a point like this, where we've tried to do a recovery, it says it's recovered, then you try to access it, and it says it's crashed, and then it, it won't recover that. We're at a point where we're almost at a point of no return here. We have to do a full database recovery. And so, as you can see, we've been going through this process. We, we, we spent some time doing this. We're trying to do tests. We do some other, there are some other tests that you can do because the MyISAM files are individual flat files. You can actually create a new version of the table without any indexes and copy over the MYD file, run a check, and then you can recreate the indexes on the table. You can actually do that. Uh, and we tried that, and, it, and the first time we tried it, it actually worked. Select from table, limit 10, 10 rows came back, excellent. So then we try to like um, select all the data and the table crashes. So we're going through these tests and at this point in time we go, okay, we're done, we really have to consider, um, I was gonna hope that I uh, was just seeing if I had the information if I didn't. Um, and then we go, okay, well now we have to consider looking at a recovery from the database. So as I mentioned, the backup files are copied from one machine to the other machine. So I start looking at the backup files on this particular server, and I try to unzip the file. Lo and behold, I get five different error messages from gzip about files being truncated or corrupt or not uncompressing properly, which is not a good thing. And so the uh, guy who runs the organization had put the files in another system, looked at the, looked at the previous backup, we looked at the backups files from last night and was also trying to uncompress the files and getting errors, unzipping the files. So now he doesn't even have a backup from last night, which is consistent to be able to get back from. And remember I mentioned to you that the first time he discovered this problem, he decided to turn binary logging off for some reason. Now he's not actually getting copies of the transactions. 
Now he has to go back to two nights backups ago to start doing a restore and then work out how far he can move forward to recover his data. So when you look at that situation, you have to be prepared for, again, more than one problem. Now, there are several faults in this strategy. One was not verifying his backup, even by making sure that he could uncompress the files. His second fault was he didn't have a copy of his binary logs. What happened if the system that did have the binary log went away? Now, what happened was that system went away. It crashed, it did a kernel panic, died. And so now he's left with the backup from two nights ago and no way to get through a whole day and a half's worth of transactions. Now, several things had happened in the time that I'd been starting looking at the system which led me to believe that the problem he was having was not MySQL related, but was hardware related. This is difficult to prove, and if any of you uh, experienced Linux people out there would understand, sometimes you can see symptoms, but you're not getting any messages to indicate that you're having some type of hardware problem. It's not until you actually have a kernel panic where you actually see what's happening on the console that something is actually bad. System messaging is not really giving you any feedback and maybe you haven't run some level of higher diagnostics. In this particular case, system crashed, kernel panic. In the data center, they have to get the ops people to come around and look at it. I'm not too sure why they had a console, but there was a console and there was a photograph because it's hard to get information of a console sometimes. And there it is, there's a hardware failure on the system. He was very lucky because the hardware failure was memory and not disk. The system actually could come up without the memory you could actually run through. We could do the same things I was doing before to recover the tables. The tables would recover. The database would come back up. Very lucky. If it had been a disk problem, then you know, his business could have suffered a catastrophic problem, irrespective of the gaps. So I can't say often enough, be prepared. Disasters can happen anywhere at any time. They are going to happen when you are not ready for them to happen. Guaranteed, they're not going to happen at midday on Monday afternoon when you've been at your desk for three hours and you've checked everything and everything is fine. One problem will generally lead to a cascading series of problems. In this particular case, it was a single server. High availability does not start with one machine. Okay, even if you just wanna have copies of your data that requires at least two machines, even if you don't wanna have two operational systems. And you should always have a contingency plan in place. In this case, the individual was lucky. He was a good customer. I've worked with him before several times. I happened to be home, happy reading my emails, happened to be able to share a few hours uh, of helping him. It was with a sense of irony that the most recent book that I've written, uh, which is actually in print right now, I was hoping it was available for this conference, but it's a few weeks away, is actually called Backup and Recovery how apropos, and that this situation was so unique that it actually made it into the book because I was actually had do, was doing proof uh, changes to the book and I had to squeeze this in. So there are many other examples and actually in the book I go through a lot of examples. I've only touched on two of them. If you don't have binary logging turned on, if you have a single server, if you don't have appropriate MySQL security and application users can delete data or change configuration or turn off the binary logs, what happens if you actually delete data? What happens if someone goes delete from table? You know there's ways to recover that, even on a single server, but if you shut down the database, then you've lost it. Or maybe you have to shut down the database to recover it, it depends. Same with actually deleting a MySQL INDB data file. You can actually physically delete the file, it's no longer there, but if you actually are aware of it, you can actually dump the data on the running server. But once you shut the server down, the file's gone. The inode is cleared up and your, your history. What happens if you delete binary logs? Another interesting problem is people do upgrades. They've tested the backup script, they've tested the recovery script, then they've upgraded the software but they forgot to retest the backup script again and now it's actually throwing an error message because they changed the version of software. A common problem between MySQL 5.1 and 5.5 for using MySQL dump. I have warned you. Corruption, 
cases where the schema may differ. MySQL has copies of data and metadata, and particularly with INODB, inconsistencies between those things. Um, INODB in MySQL has a thing called automatic crash recovery. So if MySQL does crash, it will come back up and it will go through a recovery process. The example I showed you before is with MyISAM, that's a manual recovery process. What happens if the automatic crash recovery process doesn't work? Or what was actually interesting was um, there are several ways to do backup and recovery, and I'm going to discuss those in a second. But you have to work out whether to do a restore MySQL has to be running or not running. Some require it to be running, some require it not to be running. But in some cases, you can use MySQL Enterprise Backup or ExtraDB and do a restore. It doesn't check to make sure it's not running, and you actually restore the data into a running database and actually corrupt the data even worse. So there are all these cases. So what are your actual tools? For backup and recovery, to do a backup, these are the options that you have. You can use MySQL dump. It's an included command. It comes with MySQL. Command line client can run remotely, uh, can run on a working on a running database, or has to run on a running database, has locking issues depending on how you use it and how your data is stored. So there are implications there to consider. You can do a file copy of your data. You can do that while the database is running, or the while the database is not running. If you do it while it's running, you are not going to get a consistent backup. Remember before I talked about static, consistent backup? A file copy of a running database will not be consistent because files are copied sequentially. If you shut it down, then you're going to get a consistent version. But you have to make sure you copy the right files. MySQL dump is pretty good because you can sort of move it between different systems, different operating systems, different uh, versions. File copy is a little bit more specific. You've got to make sure you're restored in the same configuration. Now, at an operating system level, you can use snapshotting technology, you know, LVM, or if you have some sort of SAN or network storage device, you can do some level of, of files or snapshots. You know, maybe if you're running ZFS or something like that, or ButterFS, I'm sure there's a few others that are snapshot friendly. But you need to make sure you've configured your system to do that. And particularly if you haven't set up LVM, then you can't actually implement that. From, a, from a, a tools perspective, Extra Backup is a product from Pacona. There's one Pacona person in the audience. Um, Peter and Baron were here before. Um, and that can actually perform a hot running backup on an inodb system. It can actually also back up tables in a blocking nature for uh, other tables in your instance as well. My Dumper is an open source product which is like MySQL Dump, but supports parallelism. MySQL dump is a single thread. MySQL dumper can support multiple threads. But has the limitations similar to MySQL dump in terms of locking, not locking, etc. And from the commercial side, MySQL Enterprise Backup, you may listen to some of the talks this morning, uh, is the former INODB hot backup tool. <coughs> I'm not going to go through these options. The purpose of this presentation is really to show you what you need to know about backups. There is actually an entire presentation that I've given which talks about each one of these particular points individually, goes through the pros and the cons as examples, and I would encourage you to check that out uh, on the Effect of MySQL website. The short link is available there. I do, however, want to talk about a couple of things. One is you have a backup and recovery strategy in place. And I want to focus on point in time recovery and replication in a moment. But before I do, there are many things that can improve your process. And I haven't talked about these, but you have to consider, even though you go through those options I talked about on the previous page, which support compression? What can run remotely? What parallel options exist? Can you incrementally do backups? All of these things can affect the strategy you have in place and more importantly, the recovery process and the recovery time. Because what normally happens is the actual time to recovery is the most important step and the most step people don't time. And the only thing that management and the business wants to know is how long. And if you don't know that answer, then uh, you're forever going to be hounded. 
I just want to point out one thing from my benchmarking of various types of uh, compression and decompression objects. Um, you know, gzip is the default for most examples. There is a parallel version of gzip called pigz, which does the same thing as gzip but runs in parallel and can be three or four times faster. That one change alone can make a big difference in a strategy. Some of the other options can take 10 times longer and give you like 5 or 10% improvement. And uh, ironically, we were just talking about uh, LZMA uh, recently uh, with another product and the time it actually takes uh, on larger files. And I didn't consider it, but we're backing up here effectively one large file and maybe some compression tools will work more efficiently with a lot of smaller files. The type of data that you're backing up, whether it's integers or strings or blobs, will also affect. This is actually just one example from the book, which is about a, it's a 2.9, it's a five gigabyte database. It sort of comes down to about 2.9 gig as a MySQL dump file. And this is the compression of that dump file. So again, testing is important to work out what works and what doesn't work. People think about backup and recovery. They don't think about the individual components. And point in time is the most important thing to work with. Point in time tells you that you can recover the data to either the most recent amount of transactions that you have available or to a certain time. For example, the minute or two before someone deleted all your data or someone hacked your system or something and so forth. If you care about your data, you have to enable binary logging. This enables point in time recovery and enables replication. I know customers who run production systems and do not have binary logging turned on. Even if you don't back them up, if you don't have it turned on, that tells me you don't care about your data. You don't care if you lose a day's worth of data. Maybe you don't care, but if you do, you should have binary logging turned on. You need to have just one option, log bin defined. Expire logs days is one also good to define because that gives you a default setting where older files will automatically be deleted because if you don't have binary logging turned on, I'm pretty sure you don't have system monitoring turned on, so you won't know what to do when your disk fills up. The show binary logs command shows you what files exist, and you can compare those file names and file sizes with actual files on the file system. I don't think those two actually line up. I should fix that. Um, the file size and the position of the binary log matches the size of the file. Now, if you want to back these up, there are several easy options. These are write once incrementing files. So you know, copy and sync can really help you in keeping consistent versions of these files. If you run a master and a slave, you can actually turn on what's known as log slave updates on the slave, and that will give you a version of the MySQL binary log files. Not exactly the same because the positions can be different, but at least it's going to give you a, a reproducible version of the data to replay if you're using that slave for recovery. DRBD, or Disk Replicated Block Device, uh, is a synchronous block level writing of data. And some people use this for MySQL. However, it really isn't practical for a high availability solution because it's a passive system. You can't use it. And it does have a certain amount of a restore time in a failover situation. However, it is ideal for creating binary, mirrored binary logs. You get them for free by using DRBD. You have a copy of those files on another system. So even on a system that you may be using, you could actually use a separate disk and have a copy of them. And new in MySQL 5.6, you can actually read the binary log files uh, remotely from the MySQL bin log, which is the command that reads the binary logs, and you can actually stream them so you can actually read them from the remote server and run them continuously to get a copy. So uh, these are other ways to get those files. Now, in the static backup, I talked you have to do a static backup and you have to copy the binary log files. This little caveat to that is like when you do the static backup, you need to know at what time you did that and what position it was with the binary logs. If you don't record that status, then you can't actually restore successfully because you don't know where to start. So an important note here is, is that if you have a master and if you have a slave and you do a show master status on the slave and you're doing a backup on the slave, 
and, sorry, and you do a show master status on that slave, you may get a binary log position, but it's not the binary log position of the master. Because a slave can also be a master. So you have to be very careful that when you run that command, you run it on the right server. And it's a problem that I've seen with customers. The tools I talked about, MySQL dump, extra backup, uh, enterprise manager, enterprise backup, my dumper, they basically all keep that information for you in various types of files. So if you're using one of those commands, or if, in the case of MySQL dump, using the master data, or on a slave, using slave data, um, you're actually going to get the right position to work with. So just be aware of capturing that. To restore that, the MySQL bin log command is the way to replay binary logs and you can say, I want to start from a certain file in a certain position and I can replay those and then I can replay all following files. A tip that some people do is when they do a backup, they do a flush logs, so therefore it actually flushes the log so it moves it to the next file. You don't really need to have to keep the position, you just have to keep the file that you want to start on. Another way to recover if you're recovering a slave is let replication do it. Because as long as you have the position of where it is in the master that it belongs to and the binary log still exists in the machine, when you start that slave it'll just catch up automatically by effectively doing what you're doing manually with MySQL bin log. So there are two ways in which you can actually get them back from the binary logs. Now, I want to conclude in this discussion about working with MySQL, the importance of MySQL replication. If you have a production system and you have one server, you are not running in a highly available environment. And if you can accept the downtime when the server's not available to restore the database, then that's great. But what happens if the hardware fails? How long does it take to replace the hardware, even though you might have the data somewhere else? Replication is practical for many different options in terms of scalability, testing, failover. There are lots of ways in which you can use it. You can use it in your backup strategy. But I want to highlight that replication is not a backup strategy by itself. Okay? It's just moving you one step away from a single point of failure. It's important that you use it in a total strategy. You may have a, a slave, but then do you have a failover process in place? So this is something to consider when you start moving towards more highly available systems. How do I support, okay, this hardware goes away or this data corruption happens? What is the recovery data objective, the RDO, and the recovery point objective, the time it takes for your business to make a re restore process? These things are important. Some of the problems with replication is, is that there are many ways for you to assume a slave is consistent with the master and there are many ways for it to be not consistent. Here is just a list of a few of those. By default, with asynchronous nature, there's no guarantee that the slave is actually the same as the master. If you get an error and you skip over things, if you actually have defined particular error messages that you want to ignore on the slave, if someone is connected to the slave as a super privilege uh, by accident, the application and deleted or changed data, they're now inconsistent. You can change the structure on a slave and providing the SQL statement executes, it's actually valid. You can actually tell the binary logging to ignore certain tables or data on the master and on the replication slave you can say ignore data that's coming in and out. So all of these things can mean that your slave is not the same as your master. And if you back up your slave, in the assumption that it is the same as the master, then you may come to be surprised when you do a restoration and you find something that has changed. Particularly over time, things change. People may have introduced settings and not considered the ramifications of their backup strategy. They can all affect replication. <coughs> now, there are some advantages in uh, using different tools. And right now, I'm actually looking at uh, Galera this week, which is a synchronous backup solution. Tungsten Replicator is another one of those that provide extra benefits to some of those things I mentioned. MySQL 5.6 is doing a lot of work in making it a lot better replication, supporting crash safe slaves, for example, by storing the position in the database within a transaction rather than on the file system. And a lot of other things here in terms of global transaction IDs, replication checksums, the remote binary log backup I talked about before, uh, and even now there are some failover utilities that come out of MySQL Workbench 
that can allow you to fail over in MySQL now natively without, for example, using some other third party product. So if you have not upgraded to 5.5, I recommend strongly that you do that. If you're running on 5.0 and 5.1, you should really get to 5.5, because 5.5 is the platform moving forward. All the great work that's being done on 5.6 is extending the base of 5.5. There's a big jump from 5.1 to 5.5 internally in terms of features and performance. So you should be getting there so that you can then consider using 5.6. Another thing is if you use replication, what people don't realize is you could, for example, be running MySQL 5.5 on a master, and you can run 5.6 on the slave. So you could take advantage of, for example, of that remote binary log backup option, which was only recently released. I was running a 5.1 test server. I just installed 5.6 on my slave and could leverage that particular tool because slaves can be ahead in version. It's forward compatible to the master. So sometimes maybe you can get some benefits like that if you have master-slave environment. So to wrap up here, leave you with a very memorable quote. SAN is not a backup solution. Um, Josh Berkus, I'm sure several Postgres people here would understand, wrote a very good article recently and there are many other references. Um, if you assume that uh, you're fine with the SAN, it's the bigger you are, the harder you will fall. I have seen it in reality with a organization running 100 servers. It does not work very well when their SAN crashes. A common problem is, is that human error leads to issues. And it doesn't matter what sort of redundancy you have in place for software, for hardware, is that a human will cause a problem, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And quite often, if you actually analyze the issues of intentional problems with data, it's usually internal more regularly than external. So it's important that you understand those situations. Um, this actually comes from Pocona White Paper, uh, which discussed from their support calls what they actually did to analyze things. And what they basically came up with was there were lots of problems that occurred that could have been easily avoided before they occurred if they'd gone through a simple process of having an appropriate strategy and testing that appropriate strategy and knowing different types of situations that are common. I find many situations that are common problems that if only you, you know, follow the basic rules of, you know, not DB101, but, you know, DB102 in terms of securing your MySQL data for uh, business continuity. I touched very briefly on the advanced features and the other presentation that I go through when I go through each particular case and I show you the pros and cons of examples, I still don't go in the advanced features. So you have to understand the benefits of each one, the time it takes, the locking strategy it might have, how you can recover it. Um, the advanced features become more and more important when you have to back up more data, how long is it going to take, etc. cetera. Um, I can't give you the one unbreakable backup solution for MySQL because there is not one. There are different options and those options depend on various factors. The size of your database, how many servers do you have in the system, the storage engines that you're using. These all change the choices that you have. Uh, replication is important. If you're not using replication, I strongly recommend that you consider the cost of having that is less important than the cost of not having it in a disaster. And until recently, I hadn't heard of something. I'd already, I, I talked before about the importance of testing. And the advent of the cloud has actually produced two things of worth. Uh, one is that there's no longer an excuse that you can't test your backup because you don't have sufficient hardware. The only thing you need is your manager's credit card, OK? Because then you can get as much hardware as you want in the cloud. Notwithstanding security and all those other pros and cons and everything like that, you can test your backup and recovery strategy. And Netflix has this concept called the chaos monkey or the Simeon Army, where they actually go through in their production system and regularly test scenarios of crashing certain things. So they're proactively testing their strategy. So I always used to say that backup and recovery was the poor cousin to scalability and performance, 
but now it can be a really hot trending topic where you can actually have fun you know, destroying things in real life uh, and going, how does the organization perform when we take out this server or this entire data center in our infrastructure? Um, and Netflix has a lot of information on that, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, you'll find my presentations generally on the effect of MySQL site, which is uh, these things now, or some older ones uh, at my own site, ronaldbedford.com. These ones will be available on that site and they'll be available also as self, so don't feel um, uh, disappointed if you can't type fast right now, because there will be other opportunities to find that information out. Everyone's happy? You can just have the URLs because you can click on presentation in the menu, you'll get there too. Um, hopefully all of this will encourage you to know I need to know more. And I was actually planning on having some of these to give away, um, but we'll, we'll have some uh, ebook versions to give away um, in the gifts from the soft thing. But um, there's a dedicated book just on backup and recovery, uh, which includes 5.5, 5.6, and if you're using the cloud, if you're using RDS, if you're using, looking at HP's cloud service or Google has a cloud SQL offering now as well, you know, you can look at some of those things. And some of those are actually beneficial. RDS and Google Cloud, for example, have offerings that give you synchronous replication of your data. MySQL by default is asynchronous, so that may be an option. But all of those things come with risks in terms of loss of control and access to instrumentation, et cetera. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions, hard questions? You know, what disaster did I have that I didn't cover? Uh, if, it's my, if, it's, if it's SQL Server related, I will not answer. <laughs> just wondering if uh, in a situation where you have a hosted website that you don't have direct access to the file system, are there, it, what, what's a decent strategy in case they go out of business that you can preserve your website, <coughs> if it's my so, <coughs> Yes, so uh, your website is hosted somewhere else. Um, I'll give you, first of all, some philosophy. That is, if you care about your data, keep your important data as close to you as possible. So that might change the strategy and where, of where you keep certain data. Uh, a good example is RDS, Amazon's RDS service, which is MySQL service provided by them. It's a hosted service. So they will give you an interface to access to the system to retrieve data. You can use tools. Maybe you can use MySQL dump uh, to extract the data to the server, for example. But if you don't have access to the binary logs, RDS doesn't give you access, you have no way to do a point in time recovery. So you're limited there. You have no way to actually look at the hardware itself to see if you're having a performance problem, you know, whether, whether the, the disk is filling up, for example. So there are all these things that are a higher risk if you've chosen to use a hosted service, and you need to consider those. And I'll further add the impact of using hosted services is they will say to you, well, we run RAID. OK, what RAID do you run? We run RAID 10. And I have been to an organization where I've asked that question, and then I've got access to the system, and I've done a look, and I go, wow, your hardware is running on RAID 5. Did you know that? Oh, no, the host provider said we're running on RAID 10, and they weren't. Host provider also says, yes, we back up your data. But do they really back it up? Where's the proof? And I've had two organizations that claim that they're running RAID systems, and when I've investigated them, they've both been running degraded RAID. So therefore, a disk has failed, and they're one step closer to failure because they're relying on a hosted service. So my advice to you is don't believe anything they say. Uh, make sure that you have a strategy to be able to get data out of there because there are many memorable examples, and I have several in the book of um, the database goes away and you've lost all your data. And it doesn't happen to a small organization. It also happened to the sidekick, for example, T-Mobile. So this isn't a MySQL example, but it shows you that large organizations can also have problems if you rely on them as a hosting service. There have been some memorable MySQL examples as well, uh, crowd surfing uh, and a few others um, I can't think of right this very second where they've shut down because they've either relied on hosting service providers or um, not had procedures in place. Sorry, that was the long answer to a short question. Hey, I've got to put some philosophy in there. The zen of backup and recovery. No more questions, no more game souls out there. Everyone else has 
you know, uh, a fully functional, working, um, you know, royalty-free um, media system running on free BSD that doesn't need MySQL backups. I've, I've got one question. Yes. Nobody, nobody else from the crowd. Uh, yesterday, um, a, a FileMaker Pro guy comes into my uh, MySQL table. He blows away all the rows uh, because that's very easy to do in FileMaker Pro. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar. Um, I don't have bin logging enabled, so I you just restore. probably weren't working in transactions either, so you couldn't do rollback? No. <laughs> so I just restored the MDY and MDI files mm -hmm. and started back the server. But if I had bin logging enabled, yes. does the bin log, and, and he just, after lunch, told me when he blew away all the records. He waited a while. How, how would I know when to go back to the start? Is the bin log... Do, is it so, human readable so I can know when to say the start? So the question is, someone ran a destructive command on your database, in this case a delete from table, and didn't tell you exactly when. If binary logging is enabled, you, it's in a binary format, so you can't look at it natively, but you can run the MySQL bin log command. And providing you're using statement level logging, now there's, 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 there's statement and uh, row and mixed, and that's a little bit more complicated, but the default is still statement. You can actually see an ASCII version of everything that's happened. So you can actually like look at it and you can do a search for delete and you can find when that actually happens. And in, that, in, in the binary log, it will actually tell you before that, you'll get a hash mark or a comment that'll say the actual position and the time. So then you could, for example, run MySQL bin log to that particular end date time or end position to catch all the data up until that point in time. So you can do some data analysis to work that out. Now I will highlight that the binary log records all of the operations, assuming that you are logging all of the operations, you haven't put any ignores uh, in there, and the person that did the work didn't have super privilege. Because of an application, if you've done grant all on star dot star, which I guarantee you at least one person in the audience has that, that is bad very, very bad because in one step it gives you super and the one thing that super can do is turn off binary logging. So if I wanted to be devious and I had that access, I'd go set binary logging off, delete from table, set binary log on, wouldn't be in your binary log, you wouldn't know when they did it. So another reason why MySQL security is also important. Now I will also, um, just, be, just to do that, uh, one of the things you want to consider in a backup and recovery strategy is keeping copies of your scheme and keeping copies of your data. Uh, you know, MySQL dump is good. The other thing you can do is you can also look at the status variables, and the status variables will give you information, particularly about alter, drop, create statements. So you can actually see if someone's actually modified the structure of, of some object, and then you can use the binary log to go looking for it. You can't really use com delete because a normal delete statement would show up in there as well. But sometimes more destructive things, you can use the status variables, even in like daily backups and keeping copies of those things, to see if something may have happened that you may not be aware of. Uh, and that's important for backup and recovery, it's important for performance, auditability, etc. Yes, question, sir. Hi, my name's Singh. What tools would you recommend to backup, say, 100 plus turnkey LAMP stacks? A virtual VPS is right. kind of automated, easy. Yeah, you could manually do all 100, but why would you want to do that? Probably take days, maybe. Sure. So what so tools would you So you have 100 recommend? databases. Uh, they're in 100 different instances, like they're actually a separate VPS instance? Yes. OK, well, so that's a good start. If they're all running on like a SaaS model in one, one instance, then you're having problems because you won't be able to restore appropriately. But if you have a separate dedicated instance and you're running that, if the size of it is relatively small, and I define small as less than 10 or maybe 20 gigabytes, then a MySQL dump will probably be fine. Okay. The impact of MySQL dump is, is that if you just run it by default, it will lock your tables because it will actually turn on lock all tables under the opt option, which is enabled by default. If it's all inodb, then you can do actually single transaction to relieve that locking potential. So in all your VPS environments, the question would be, is there a maintenance window? 
can we afford five or 10 minutes to not have access to the data? If it's maybe like, you know, one gig, then maybe it takes 20 seconds. And so it, that may be okay. Um, you know, it will depend on the circumstances, but in a smaller environment, that's probably the quickest and easiest option. You can run it remotely. Uh, it's pretty easy to restore, as long as it doesn't take too long to restore if it's not too large. Uh, you can schedule them across any particular time. You know, you can run them at different times of day and it will have to happen at the same time. Um, you can use it to like migrate things a little bit more easily. It'll give you some flexibility and it's included in the tools by default. Okay. The biggest caveat is size. As it gets too large, it'll take too long to restore. And also the locking. They're the two things you want to worry about. Anyway, uh, thank you all for attending. My time is up. I'm going to be here all weekend, including the open database camp we have on Sunday, which is an unconference. So I don't know if you guys are sticking around, but there will be my SQL people that'll be here. We, we can talk about anything um, now or later as well. Thank you. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, 
and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.